Good evening, Emerge Church people. How are you? Let's do that hair thing again, like we did this morning. Turn to someone and say, oh, wow, you are doing something cool with your hair. Keep it up. What's going on? You worked on that. You worked on that hair. I know you did. All right. Cool. All right. Well, how many of you are here this morning? How many of you are not here this morning? How many of you wouldn't lift your hand no matter what I said? <laughs> Some of you, all right, cool. Well, it is um, part two and I encourage you to, uh, to hear uh, this morning's podcast. Uh, and so tonight we're sort of unpacking further the mystery of, of God's love for us, the love of God at work in our lives to bring about our highest good, to bring about our highest good. But please understand that God's assessment of your highest good goes beyond um, just this lifetime. And that what God's calling your highest good actually extends beyond this level of your existence. <laughs> so that's where we're going to go tonight. All right, so let's pray. Who's in for that? We're already experiencing a great sense of God's presence. And so, Lord, we position our hearts to receive. We've heard so many sermons, but we never tire of hearing a word from you. Send us out of here with a revelation, a revealing of more of you, your purposes in our lives. Help us to not walk groping around, but with intention and a firm grip on our understanding of why we're here and what we're here to accomplish for you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, here's where we're going to start. We're going to start with a very unusual miracle that Jesus did. And that is the healing of the blind man uh, using mud. And so John chapter 9 says he spit. That's Jesus. He spit on the ground. He made mud with the saliva and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. Now I happened to be there with my iPhone and I took a photo. So if we could have that photo up there. There it is. I just pulled it out, clicked it off there. All right. So we have that moment. And then we have the next moment where he comes back seeing again. This is the part we love to sing a part about, write books about. Yay, God, you're awesome. You're loving. You're kind. A miracle working God. But I want to take you back to that other moment or that moment. And can we just take a moment to think how this must have felt? There was nobody there to tell this guy, it's okay, one day this is going to be in the Bible. All right? There was nobody there sort of saying, it's okay, this is going to be all right, there's a miracle on its way. All he knew was he'd asked for a miracle and what he was getting was mud. And not only was he getting mud, he was getting mud in the very area he wanted to get better. He'd asked, and now it was worse. Jesus intentionally was putting mud on the very place where the guy was wanting a healing and a miracle. So can we acknowledge just before, see, we know how the story plans out. But can we just think, hang on a minute, imagine if we didn't. Imagine if we were standing there in the crowd and watching Jesus do this and say, he's lost it, he's lost it. He needs a break. This is, this is vicious, this is cruel, this is insulting. You know, somebody help Jesus. Um, <clears throat> but we need to just freeze frame and think, wow, what, what a moment this, this actually was. Uh, in this moment, all he knows is he's asked for a miracle and what he was getting was mud. He can't see, but he can hear. And what he can hear is... Yeah, and next minute, he can't see, but he can feel. And next minute, he's feeling this warm, gooey stuff go on his eyes and, and he can't see, but he can smell. And he's thinking... Is that 
Is that mud? Is that? He's putting it all together and thinking, did he just spit on the ground? And he's now smearing mud. Can you imagine how confusing uh, this must have been? How offensive. It was offensive. Wow. And, and all those things. And, and so I want to speak to people in the room tonight who are in a mud moment. This is you. You're that person. You ask for a miracle and things are getting worse. And it seems like Jesus has put mud on the very area of your life that you are asking him to help you with. So that could be you or even you could have a family member that's going through a mud moment uh, right now. Now let's qualify what a mud moment is. If you're driving your car really fast, eating your lunch and texting on your phone and you crash, that's not a mud moment. That's you being an idiot. Okay, we're not talking about those moments. I mean, if you're lazy, perpetually sleeping at work, uh, turning up late and the boss sacks you, that's not a mud moment. That's you get your act together. All right? Okay, we're not talking about those sorts of moments. We're talking about what's happening to this guy and it's for no apparent reason he's getting mud. That's what we're actually talking about here. So, And we need to talk about uh, these mud moments because this is when people walk away from God. They get all confused. Thanks a lot, Jesus. I'm getting, I'm getting mud and I asked you for a miracle. So we've done a, a great job of preparing people for miracles, but what do we say to them when they're in that moment? Yes, okay, we're trusting for a miracle, but right now this is what we got. We got this mud moment. What do we say to them? Well, we could say the devil did it. Well, I want to tell you, you need to be careful with that. Because if you keep shrotting that out every time something bad goes on, we've got a very powerful devil and a very weak Jesus. Because apparently he's very busy and he's kicking us around like footballs because the devil did it every time. So I don't know. Be careful with that one. All right. Uh, or we could, we could come alongside them and we could say, it's going to be okay. I'm just amazed at these war movies where the guy's lost his leg, you know, he's obviously dying and his mates are going, it's going to be okay, it's going to be. No, it's not going to be okay. <laughs> You're dead, buddy. It's just a matter of time. Don't tell the guy it's going to be okay. So uh, I know we mean well by trying to give people that assurance, but in a genuine mud moment, we don't know it's going to be okay. Because you know why we don't know it's going to be okay? Because we don't have a clue what's going on either. We really don't have a clue. I mean, if you, you might have thought that you'd have been cool watching Jesus be crucified, you wouldn't have been standing there saying, that's good. That's the saviour of the world. No, you would have been going, this is bad. This is really bad. It would have looked like this innocent man being crucified and tortured by the Romans. I would have been working out how to hide the nails or run off with the hammer. Meanwhile, this was a, a humongous moment and yet I would interpret it, interpret it as a, one of these moments. This is bad. This is terrible. This is what is going on here. All right. So to our outward appearances in a mud moment, it looks like an innocent person is suffering. So how could any good ever come from this? And so while we're, we're staring at the mud, we're trying to make sense of the mud, and we're, we're, what's actually happening is we're totally missing the point. We're totally missing the point and the, the greater purpose of what's going on here. And so here is a revelation moment for people in this room struggling with mud on your life right now. You asked for a miracle and you got mud. And now the mud has become your focus. You're crying about the mud. You're angry about the mud. You're trying to make sense out of the mud. But listen, the miracle is not in the mud. If the miracle was in the mud, Jesus would have said, now leave that on for about ooh, an hour or so. Let it just soak in there. He no sooner put it on, he said, now get it off. 
immediately he said, now go get it off. So Jesus put the mud there. If there was something inherently good about the mud itself, Jesus would have told him to leave it there. But instead he tells him to get it off because there's nothing good in the mud. So why is the mud put there by Jesus? Listen, so you could go through the process of getting it off. That's why I put it there. So that you would go through the process of getting it off. Please notice that this man's miracle did not happen when the mud was applied, but when he took it off. All right. So the miracle's not in the mud. It's what happens in you. It's what happens in you as you go through the process of washing it off. Please understand that God's view of your highest good is very different to what you think. God views the miracle that's happening in you. The person that you're becoming is of far greater value than a temporal miracle that's happening in this life. It is. It is. The, the, the mud that comes on our lives will always vex us until we realise that God is using a very different value system in the way he's dealing with us. And he's calling it good. You know, when Jesus Christ was dying that death on the cross, the Father was looking down saying, that's good. That's good. We would have been going, that's not good. That's not good. So the greater value to God is the person you are becoming. That's the only thing you're going to get to take with you in eternity. Everything else you're going to leave behind. So God's value system that he's calling good, he will never surrender something of eternal value to give you something of temporal value. He will never call that good. Because God, even though you and I may forget something about ourselves, God never does. And that is, you're eternal. You're eternal. You're, you're a spirit having a human experience. That, that this is just one stage of your existence. When, when this stage of your existence is over, you won't cease to exist. You'll just change your existence. And God never loses sight of that. And so the way he's dealing with us, calling it good, is of a very different value system. And this is why, why is this so valuable to God? Who we're becoming? Because he's working with this reality that we are a spirit here on the planet having a human experience that when we die, we don't cease to exist. We just change our existence. And the only thing we get to take with us from this stage of our existence to the next is the person that we've become. And that's why a miracle that happens in you is supremely more valuable to God than a miracle that happens to you. And this is why God permits things by his wisdom that you know he could have prevented by his power. When that gets you, you, you get all vexed about the mud. How could this happen? How could God say he loves me and this is going on? Well, God permits things by his wisdom that he, you know he could have prevented by his power. Look at this verse in uh, Psalm 84. It's one of my life verses. It says, Psalm 84, 5 and 6, it says, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. You know what a pilgrim is? It's a person on a journey to a sacred destination. That's what a, that's what a pilgrim is. These people have got who they are. They haven't forgotten who they are. You, Christian, tonight, you might have forgotten. God never forgot. You're a pilgrim. You're on a journey to a sacred destination. And then so God's dealing with you. God's calling good. It's a very different perspective. <laughs> He's getting you ready for something. They've set their hearts on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Bacchus, these pilgrim people, they've learned to do something. They make it a place of springs or a, a well. The valley of Bacchus is not so much a geographical place. It's a place we pass through on our journey in life. And the backer means weeping and brokenness. Check it out. 
And the Bible is talking about you and I going through times in our lives of weeping and brokenness. But if we get it, if we get we're on a pilgrimage, we don't get bitter in that place, we get better. Yeah, what we do is we get busy digging a well, not a grave. That's what we do. We, we turn this thing around and we don't waste it. All right. We learn how to transform our suffering into this deep place of resource. That's what a well is, a, a spring. There's a well in you. There's a well in me. I'd like to think I'm up here ministering to you out of a well. How did I get it? I had to go through the valley of Bacher. And I didn't spit the dummy and, and go, well, if God treats me like this, I'm out of here. I learned I'm on a pilgrimage and I'm going to make this work. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it do something in me as a person because that's what I get to take with me into eternity. Everything else I leave behind. So these people have transformed their, their suffering. Uh, and I want to tell you, if you don't learn to transform your pain, you will transmit your pain. And the rest of us will have to put up with it. Yeah. If you don't learn, get on pilgrimage, get a pilgrim attitude, set your heart on pilgrimage, you will start transmitting your pain. So these people have learned how to glean seed from their sorrow and now they're sowing it into a better tomorrow in their lives. And so what is the key to this transformation of their suffering is they've set their heart on pilgrimage. They've got it. So we're supposed to be in this world as pilgrims. So easy to forget that, isn't it, sometimes? And when we forget who we are, we develop all sorts of illusions about this, what this life is meant for and what this life is meant to bring us. Because we forget, oh, actually, it isn't all about this. <laughs> but when, we've, when we develop an illusion about this life, we start expecting a lot of stuff from it. So if our view of life doesn't extend any further than this stage of our existence, then of course we're going to get confused and offended by mud moments. Of course we're going to be really confused about it all. People keep telling me that they, they, they can't find a purpose to life. And I want to say that's because they're looking where it isn't. The purpose to this life is beyond this life. That's why the Bible ends the way that it does. So, so why are you and I here? We're here to get something on this stage of our existence that we could get no other way than by being here. Number one, the free will choice to choose salvation restoration, transformation through Jesus Christ. Number two, we're, we're here to get something we could get no other way other than by being here. And that is maturity. We're here to grow up. It's amazing how everybody wants to be an overcomer, but nobody wants anything to overcome. It's just amazing. We all want to sing. That. Yeah, where's my crown? Yeah, well, you, yeah, it's, it's called a reward for something, right? Okay, so, so why has God placed us here to acquire maturity? Well, read the back of the book, the back of the Bible, flip to the back and see that the Bible ends in a very similar way to the way it began. It begins with God and man in open relationship on the earth and it ends with God and mankind in open relationship on the new earth. Doesn't end with heaven, harps, design labor robe, you know, mansion. That's a great place. Oh, I'm not trying to take heaven away from you. There is the heaven, but it's a great waiting place. That is not the ultimate place. Read the back of the book. We're headed for a new earth when the kingdom of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Where they're singing a song about us ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ in heaven right now. So in God's future, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And so we could say that God's mud moments 
are part of his way of preventing small people from being in charge of large things. Yeah, silence moment. (laughs) I wonder if what God's calling good is of a completely different economy to us. And when he sees us having to work through that bitterness and work through that unforgiveness and work through that offence and work through and seeing us grow up, he says, that's good. That's good. Mud moments could well be a part of God's plan to stop small people being in charge of big things. And so it's with an eye on the future that God has strategically placed dipstick people in your life. (laughs) Absolutely, dipstick people. And if you're sitting beside that dipstick, look straight at me. Do not look at them. You could be trouble in the car going home. So just look straight at me. In fact, men, I'd suggest you have a look like, I don't know what he means. I don't know what he's talking about right now. Dipstick people, you know, in our cars, we've got this little thing, that dipstick that goes right down and finds out how much black stuff there is in there. And God strategically makes these these certain people that can get right down inside and find the black stuff. See, I'm looking at you, you're, uh uh-huh. yeah, let's see how you go with a dipstick person. They can find that black stuff there. See, they don't create it, they reveal it. It's already in you. It's already in you, that stuff. You're thinking, oh, I think I'm there. I think, yeah, I'm awesome. Oh, yeah, let's see how you go with a dipstick person. Yeah, yeah. They'll find that. I am the father of seven children. I've had an abundance of dipstick moments, you know, where they found the black stuff in Dad. He might be the pastor, but we got the black stuff. We found it in there. And so, and in church life, I've learned... Better the dipsticks you know than the dipsticks you don't know. I would play, God, take this person out. But no sooner would they leave than here comes another one. I'm going far out. So I've stopped doing that. I've said, at least I know my dipsticks now. And I'm sticking with them. Better the dipstick you know than the dipstick you don't know. So a bit of homework. This week I suggest get a piece of paper, draw three columns, dipsticks in my life. What it is I find annoying about it and what it is God's trying to teach me. And if somebody comes up to you after the meeting and says, how do you spell your name again? You're going on. You're going on their list. Okay. Mark, what? (laughs) Let's get this right. All right. So this is all part of God's plan. Dipsticks are part of God's plan. Thank God for them. And now, some people find all this talk about mud moments and pilgrimage depressing, but it's actually meant to be empowering. Imagine being alive now with a rock-solid certainty of where you're going. Wow, that's incredibly empowering. That, That gets your grippy little hand, gimme, 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 my name's Jimmy, hand, to open up And go, you know what? I can be generous. I can be forgiving. Pilgrims travel light. They don't, I've yet to see a pilgrim in India with a fridge on their back. They travel light. You know why? Because they've got a long way to go. And I want to tell you, some of you need to renew your heart on pilgrimage because you're carrying bitterness, unforgiveness, junk carrying it for years. It's way too heavy. We're supposed to be looking at all that offence and everything go, I'm not picking that up. I'm letting that go. I'm not carting that all through my years on this pilgrimage. So when we get pilgrimage, it just alters. Pilgrims live with this awareness that they're on this long journey to a sacred destination. And so they have this very different attitude. Pilgrims get this next verse that's going up on the screen from from, uh, James. This makes every bit of sense to a pilgrim. From James, he says, consider it a sheer gift. (laughs) 
when tests and challenges come at you from all sides, you know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colours. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. That's a word for people in this room. Don't try and get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work. So you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. Your maturity is not going to be wasted. You're going to take it with you into the next level of your existence. That's why God is so locked into it. So please give up the illusion that life is actually all about your happiness. That's incredibly selfish way to live. Because now I'm going to make everybody else miserable to sacrifice their happiness to keep me happy. And I'll feel perfectly fine breaking all these commitments and promises that I've made because why did you do that? Because well, not, I'm not happy. And life's all about my happiness. So yeah, flick that, flick that, flick that. I want to tell you, that's a myth. That's a myth. You're not here for your... No, you're not here to be miserable either. But you're here to get something far more important. You're here to grow up. You're here to get something incredibly valuable. And that is maturity. So a real life is actually lived managing the tensions of opportunity and opposition of possibilities and problems. That's a real life. Nothing's wrong with this life. That's a life. <laughs> Favor and failure. A real life has mountains and valleys and has joy and sorrow. And a real life has mud in it. That's a real life. And that doesn't tell me that anything's wrong with you. It just tells me, welcome to the planet. Welcome to the planet. So maybe one of our biggest problems is we think we're not supposed to have them. We hide them. Oh, everything's awesome. Yes, fantastic. See, if I was up here withholding from you all the crapola going on in my life right now and just presenting all this wonderful, oh, yeah, and then it has happened and then that happened, I have created an illusion in your mind as to who David's story is. That David's story does not exist. I need to give you the other 50% of the crapola that I'm also dealing with, the black stuff, and also, and then you start to get a true picture of David. <laughs> that's the real guy. That's, that's who he, he really is. And the tragedy is we go on, we, we keep up this facade because we think that we're not meant to have mud, we think we're not meant to have problems and, and struggles. So we create this, this persona that we're projecting at one another. And the worst thing about our hypocrisy is that other people start to aspire to being the illusion that we are presenting. So now they're either doomed to be discouraged or join us in our hypocrisy. Let's not do that. Let's not do that. Listen, just uh, this is. But you might say, but David, doesn't that mean I'm a loser if things aren't going great and fantastic and awesome in my life? No, it doesn't. Look at this next verse in Hebrew. It says, This trouble you're in isn't punishment, it's training. The normal experience of children. So maybe right now you're sitting here covered with mud and you're trying to work out what it all means and what does this mud mean about you? What does this mud mean about God? But please understand the miracle is not in the mud. It's nothing to do with it. It's all about you doing what's required to wash it off. The miracle's not in the mud, it's in the person you become as you deal with it. So over my entire life as a follower of Jesus, I've prayed for blessing on my life and I have been so blessed, but I've also had some mud moments. Is that okay for me to tell you that? All right. And 
I could go into great detail about my mud moments and now you're listening and saying, you call that a mud moment? Oh, I've got worse mud moments than that. And now we're like playing poker with our mud moments. I'll see your mud moment and I'll raise it. You were brave. I lived in a cardboard box on the side of the road and walked to school in the snow in Brisbane. <laughs> what? Hello. So now... We're doing with our mud moments something that Jesus never intended. We're almost bragging about them. They have become so a part of our story, they're now a part of our identity. I say, how are you? And you want to tell me about your mud moment. Hang on a minute. What we're meant to be doing is washing this stuff off. And so in a strange way, never intended by Jesus, the mud that was supposed to be washed off immediately has now stuck to us. We've taken so long to get to the pool, it's dried mud on us. It's stuck to us. We should have hurried, got on the way, but we stopped to talk to everybody on the way. Look at you, you wouldn't believe it. And so the mud dries, sticks to us. And it becomes a part of who we are. It's taken on a meaning Jesus never intended it to to mean. It was never meant to mean guilt or shame or rejection or self-hatred or failure. It was never meant to mean any of that. And we've been wandering around wearing the mud for so long, we should have gone straight to the pool. And we keep telling our mud story in the hope that somebody will unlock the mystery of what it's all about. When really the whole point was this one who was now blind can now see. That's about it. That was what it was all about. The one who was now blind can now see. I'm going to ask the singers and musicians to come back and help us. So some of us have come from other places and other cities. And we came here asking God to give us a better life and what you got was mud. And the Lord says, go and wash and deal with it. And in the process of washing the mud off your eyes, you'll be open, your eyes will be open to a, a brand new possibilities that you can't see before. That's the word of the Lord for people here today. Some of us have asked the Lord to resolve issues of conflict in our relationship and it seems like things just got worse. And you know what the Lord's saying to you? I put the mud there. Because you were so stuck in your reactionary knee-jerk response, I wanted to jolt you out of your rut. That's why I put the mud there. Now, come on. I wanted to stir you out of your complacency so you'll deal with the things that you were previously content to deal with. I did that. Now, go and wash it off. Go and deal with it. And your captivity is over. Some of us have asked for physical healing and yet the mud has come. And for some of us, the Lord's saying, your soul was in pain long before your body was and you did nothing about it. And now your body is simply mirroring the pain that your soul is. Now, come on, come on, get your way to the pool. Deal with that bitterness, that anger, that unforgiveness and be healed. We asked for a miracle and what happened? We got mud. But the mud was merely God's way to awaken in us the response that is needed to bring sight to our blindness. Jesus put the mud on the blind man's eyes and said immediately, go and wash yourself in the pool. And some of us, gotten lost on the way to the pool but you know what that wasn't just a window of time we're going to open up the pool right down the front here (laughs) it's not too late it's not like oh this truth that I brought to you tonight you can still activate it in your heart and in your life so let's bow our heads and and close our eyes as we just come to this response moment and create a pool moment of washing and cleansing and people recommitting their hearts to pilgrimage. People in this room that have forgotten who they are. 
and your clutching hand will open. That stuff you've been carrying, you let go of as you thought, you know what? I'm a pilgrim. I'm here to grow up. I'm here to overcome. I'm here to learn how to deal with this stuff. Let's pray. Lord, we love you, but sometimes we think you are disappointing and confusing. We trust you, Lord, but sometimes we wish you'd show up sooner than what you did. We honour you as Almighty, but sometimes we think you could have handled things better. And Lord, we confess that we've gotten lost on the way to the pool and the mud that was meant to be washed off has stuck to us. And now we come as you intended. We're here to be washed. We need you, God. We need you, God. And while the singers and musicians are creating that atmosphere of response, that's what we're going to do. There's people here tonight that need to respond to God. Say, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm done carrying this stuff. We speak strength into these weary